Hello, my name is Brian Martin, and I'm here to share my teaching practicum experience here for the class Jesus and the Caesars with Dr. Kim Majeski as our professor from Anderson University School of Theology. For this teaching practicum, I chose to do the book of Romans. Um, right now, we have gone from chapter 1 through chapter 8 and talking some about how we can apply the things that I have learned in the class Jesus and the Caesars to how um, we study the scriptures, especially the book of Romans, and knowing the, some of the historical background that went along with Paul writing this to the church in Rome at the time. Uh, we find that, first of all, some historical things that we talked about in the class was that the book of Romans was probably written somewhere between uh, AD 55 through AD 57, somewhere in that time period. And with that being the case, um, it's during that time period that um, the Emperor Nero was ruling. And um, being able to know a little bit about what we learned from the class about Nero and who he was and how he really wasn't uh, a friend at all, really, to um, Christians, um, to the Jews, and which often he saw and other emperors saw the Christians as just kind of an extension um, of the Jewish, just a smaller sect of the Jewish people. So he kind of clumped them, and often the rulers um, would clump them together, the Christians, with the Jews. And they often wanted to make sure that they kept them um, under control. And whenever they began to step out of, out of the control of the, the Roman Empire, um, Nero was one of those people that did whatever he could to let them know that they weren't in control and that he was. And because of that, several Christians were, were persecuted and hurt throughout that time. Um, this being the case, um, knowing that Nero was the, the emperor at that time, um, knowing that it was a hard way to go often for many Christians um, to live in Rome. And when Paul wrote this book to the Roman believers there, some of the things that we're able to know about the culture is seen, I believe, through the book of Romans. Um, first of all, we talked about, again, chapters 1 through chapter 8. And really starting, first of all, in chapter 1, one of the things that we talked about is just knowing what the culture was at the time. The Roman Empire was a very ungodly um, culture, um, very much uh, worshipping of idols, very much uh, worshipping sometimes of even leaders and emperors. Um, but, but knowing that they didn't believe in the one and only true God that the Jews followed, that, that the Christian believers followed. And with that in mind, you see some of the traces of that um, in the book of Romans. First of all, with chapter 1, we talked about, with this being the culture that it was um, in the first century, that when, when, when Paul spoke to the believers there about how to look at the culture and see just how corrupt the culture was, um, he talks about how, you know, um, the, the, the problems of homosexuality that was going on, talking about just all of the ways that the lying and stealing and, and, and breaking laws, disobeying parents, and just all of this corruption that was going on in the culture. Um, Paul wanted the Christians there to realize that it was because these people had chosen to exchange the worship that was due to God to worship other things and animals and images. Um, and they, in doing so, this was the lifestyle that God had really given them over to. So as the believers, the Christians at that time were reading this, this book from Paul, they were able to look um, at the culture and look at what Paul was writing and make a connection and say, yes, the reason why the things are in the culture and how they are is because these people have, as Paul has has rightly pointed out, they have exchanged their worship that should be going to God to exchange that worship to, to worship other things and people and animals and images and things like that. So with that, that is what led that into the culture being so corrupt, um, so disobedient, so ungodly as it was. And, and knowing now a little bit more about that time period that, that Paul wrote this, it, it makes sense that, that those believers would need to be able to make some connection and say, you know, why is it that, that people are so ungodly, people are so disobedient, so you know, worldly, so hateful, and, 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 and living lifestyles in, 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 in evil ways? Why is it this way? Well, 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 Paul tells them it's because they have exchanged worship to God and they worship other things and other people and, and images. 
we go along with that and move into chapter two, uh, which was so crucial as we talked about in our class time, is that um, though these people would look at these uh, Hellenistic um, Greeks and how ungodly they were, some of them came from that background. And, uh, but in this, this, now they're believers, it could have been easy for them as Jewish uh, Christians or even as non-Jewish Christians to look and maybe judge those people for how they were living. And in chapter 2, um, Paul really challenges the people and say, listen, even though you see this ungodly um, lifestyle, this ungodly culture that you're living in, um, don't point at those people as if you haven't done the same thing. Um, to know that you have also been um, living ungodly lives, that you also check your life, and you have also been lying and stealing and cheating often like they are. You have lived your life like them. And part of what, as, as believers, that we need to be able to do, that Paul was challenging them, is to see that don't become this judgmental, critical um, person or group of people who are pointing at our culture as if they are the only ones that are doing evil when there are at times that we're doing the same things that those people who are non-believers are doing as well. And that challenge that, that Paul gave to the church there in chapter 2 was really to kind of get them back into the right focus and realizing that sometimes uh, believers, the church, um, is living just as ungodly as those people that are in the world. So with that, he kind of moves and challenges them to that, to go into chapter 3 and just kind of say, listen, what's important to know is that, that no one is righteous, that, that no, not one is righteous. And he, he quotes the scripture of Old Testament that we realize that not just the people who are um, pagan, people who don't believe in God, that they're unrighteous, that they're ungodly, but we find that also people who are believers, we're all ungodly, that apart from God, that, that none of us can be righteous. And it's important to know that we're all on the same playing field. And I believe that's part of what, what Paul was trying to challenge the, the believers there in Rome to understand is that, yes, you have been saved. But remember, first of all, this corrupt culture that you live in, that you often are the same way as those people have, have been living their lives, and that none of us, whether you are a Jew and you're a Christian, whether you are not a Jew, um, whether you are a person who came out of um, the, the culture of, 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 of Gentiles and became a Christian, none of us can be righteous on our own. And um, with that, it's so important to know that as Paul wrote that, that they were able to identify that as they looked around their culture and was probably able to see, yes, those who aren't believers, those who are believers, we all are in the same boat that none of us are righteous. None of us are better than each other on our own merit. So he moves in from that in chapter 3 and reminding us that no one is righteous and goes into chapter 4 and really to say that, the only people who are righteous are people who live by faith, just like Abraham. And then he uses Abraham as an example, um, not only to the, to the Jews there, but also the people who were non-Jews who were believers. They can hopefully um, look back at this, this man of faith, Abraham, and how he lived his life. And that his life was about trying to honor God, but that he trusted God. And it was because of his faith in God that that is what made him righteous. And I believe Paul was trying to also challenge the believers there um, in the New Testament, there in Rome, to realize again that, that yes, it is only by faith in Jesus Christ, just like Abraham had this great faith, that they too have faith in Jesus, and that is what makes them righteous, not doing and observing the law within itself, apart from, from God. So with that, Paul begins to challenge them to be people of faith, to rule out that they will be following in the footsteps of Abraham when they are living by faith, and that just like God declared Abraham righteous because of his faith, we too, are, are believers at that time too, would be able to know that in Rome, what made them righteous, what made them great in God's eyes, not was that if they were a Jew or if they were a non-Jew, um, but that they were people who had put their faith in God. And with that, um, Paul really begins to, to make sense of all of this and pulls this all together, I believe, in chapter 5, when he says, um, because of this great love that God has for us, that he's allowed us to be righteous 
by our faith in Jesus. And he says, at just the right time, at just the right time, God sent Jesus into the world for sinners, to die for sinners. And that we um, and people who are believers should be able to know that what makes us righteous is our faith in Jesus Christ and what Jesus did for us and not in what we do by observing the law. Now, just as the people at that time understood um, that observing the law would not make them righteous, it was only by faith in Jesus, often they needed to be reminded of that. As they looked around in the culture, it would be so easy for them to look around and think, well, we're so much better than those people are because we have the law or, or because we, we hang out with other believers. And we're trying to live this perfect you know, life observing the law. And we come to find out as, as Paul challenges the believers there is that no, you can't do that. It's only by faith. And that God allowed a way. He made an access for us to be righteous in his sight because of our faith in Jesus Christ. And he said Jesus, not when we were good people, not because we were righteous people, but while we were still sinners. This is the love that God has for us, that he came to save us and make us righteous, not by our own merit, not because we had everything good going on, and not because we were observing the law and doing everything right, but he made us righteous because he sent his son Jesus into the world to be righteousness for us. And in that sense, when we put our faith in Jesus Christ, then we become righteous as well. He moves on from chapter 5 and really challenging us about faith to realize in chapter 6 that, that we understand that it's the symbol of baptism that reminds us of the fact that our faith in Jesus Christ and what he did really is what saves us. And to go back to understand that that was that point in our lives and to use baptism as this physical expression to be able to connect with, yes, that was the moment in which I died to myself and I died to be a slave of sin and I began to be a slave of righteousness. This is what allows us to be able to be in right with God. Not baptism itself, but the fact that our faith in what Jesus did and our faith in, in resuming that death, burial, and resurrection to show that we are right with God because of our identity come from what Jesus did for us. So in that sense, we begin to realize that we no longer can be um, living under the law to be made righteous, but that is our faith in Jesus Christ and that we're no longer slaves to the law. We're no longer slaves to sin, but we are slaves to righteousness, to, to trying to live God the way God wants us to live, to live life the way God wants us to live, and to realize that <clears throat> our faith in Jesus Christ is the foundation of our righteousness. So moving from there to chapter 6 to chapter 7, it's important to know that, that, that Paul comes back to say and understanding in the sense that, yes, though we've been saved by faith, through, through grace, through what Jesus Christ has done for us, and yes, we have expressed our faith in Jesus through baptism, there's a sense in which even though we are made righteous, it doesn't necessarily mean that we don't still struggle with sin. And Paul begins to, in chapter 7, share his own personal struggle with sin and how even though he sees the law as being something that is good, that's holy, and that's right, he realizes that he cannot live up to the law. Even under our faith in Jesus Christ, we are still tempted. We are still tempted to, to do things that we shouldn't do or to not do things that we know that we shouldn't do. So in that sense, Paul begins to share this war, this struggle within him, that even though um, he is a, a believer in Jesus, he still fights this battle of realizing that, man, there are still times that I am tempted to give in to my selfishness, to give in to my flesh, and to, to do the things that I know I shouldn't do, or to sometimes not do the, th the things that I know that I should do. So this in that battle that, that Paul begins to say, so, so what can save us? Who can save us from this life? That even though I have been saved, I still have this struggle with sin. Who can save us from, from this? And, and, and Paul begins to say, it's Jesus Christ. Thanks be to God that, that through Jesus Christ, we can be righteous. Because of what he did for us on the cross, 
that, that we now don't have to be in condemnation. And that's why he moves into chapter 8. Therefore, there is no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. It is our faith in Jesus Christ that makes us right. And in doing so, in making us right, it doesn't mean that we can now observe the law on our own. He says now in chapter 8, that it's when the Holy Spirit begins to live in us that the Holy Spirit begins to empower us to live this life of faith, begin to empower us to not be slaves to sin and ungodliness, but to be slaves to God. That the Holy Spirit that's living within us, he continues to stress this, this spirit living inside of us, that he is helping us um, to one, to be reminded that we are saved by grace, we are saved by our faith through Jesus, to two, to remind us of the teachings of Jesus, to remind us that that's where we are saved, um, but to also remind us that, that it's the work of the Holy Spirit that is transforming us and conforming us into the likeness of Jesus Christ, and that that's really been God's goal in this whole thing all along, that he is wanting us to be more and more like Jesus, so he sent Jesus to first of all save us and make us righteous by our faith in what he did for us on the cross in his resurrection, but then he also provides the Holy Spirit to empower us to live a life that will be honoring to God.